we'll move uh, the instrument a little bit and change the distance uh, to the satellites. The next time the satellite sends its signal, it will take slightly more or less time to reach the receiver, depending on how the ground has shifted. This change in the ground after a quake is often imperceptible to the naked eye. But the GPS receiver is so precise that if its position changes by mere millimeters, it can detect the shift. And it's these very small changes uh, that the instrument can pick up, which we can use to infer what happened during the event. But scientists have had to wait until the swarm grew more threatening for the GPS technology to be effective. We usually need a much bigger earthquake before we can see displacements uh, in the surface. Um, so we really didn't think to do much uh, at the beginning of the swarm because the earthquakes were so small. But when activity rates jump in mid-April, they realize they can't afford to wait any longer. That's an indication that perhaps something bigger could happen uh, in the future. It really created a sense of urgency uh, for us to get GPS out uh, to try and measure what was going on. Around the 22nd of April, we got our instruments um, out around the swarm, uh, which turned out to be very fortunate because a couple days later, the intensity of the swarm really picked up. On April 24th, the swarm once again strengthens its assault. A magnitude 4.1, the largest quake to date, crashes into Reno at 3.47 p.m. Only eight minutes later, another one strikes. Well, the earthquake rate at that point takes off. I mean, it's very clear that, that we're not done yet. Five more quakes, magnitude 2.6 or larger, hit that day, continuously rattling homes throughout Reno. If you look at the number of earthquakes occurring, uh, they're just running off the chart. This is, this is April 15th, and we thought that was a, a rocking rate of earthquakes, and this is even steeper. And we thought, man, we had problems here. Well, this is several times that rate. So now you're, you're, really, you're talking several felt earthquakes per hour, and so this is, this is a, a very serious situation because we don't know where it's going at this point. What's the next step? You know, you're watching this, watching this earthquake sequence happen. Um, so what do we do? What are you going to do if it's magnitude 6? Most modern buildings are constructed to withstand a single magnitude 6 quake, but no one can predict if months of smaller quakes have already weakened the city. The question is how many magnitude 3 earthquakes followed by magnitude 4 earthquakes you know, what is the structural breaking point, the cumulative effect of smaller earthquakes? That we don't know, and that was a big concern. We had sent out of the strongest earthquake risk message we'd ever given in Nevada. Now is a great time for them to think about, am I ready for an earthquake? At that point, I think all we could do was just watch the situation. The next day, five more quakes of magnitude 2 or 3 target Reno's suburbs throughout the day. Of course, everyone wants to know, will this earthquake pattern continue? Well, seismologists say right now it's just too difficult to tell. Then, just before midnight, the biggest one yet, a magnitude 5, slams into the city. I live on the south side of Reno and it shook me out of bed um, and immediately of course all the radios all the telephones all the 911 lines were lit up with people thinking you know that this was the big one Reno 911 you need fire ambulance yeah, I'm in northwest Reno my walls are all cracked from this big earthquake just now the energy equivalent of magnitude 5 is, is it's on the order of a small atom bomb so yikes to have it be relatively shallow it's a, it's a crazy thing to have in a community. The shaking is strong, but the quake quickly subsides. Many homes suffer minor damage, but somehow most of Reno miraculously escapes unscathed. Scientists are even more puzzled when the data from the quake comes in. Ground motions were, were extremely high, uh, much higher than you'd expect for a magnitude 5 earthquake or, or what we'd expect the shaking was in the, in the Mogul area. The discovery only raises more questions about why such a strong, shallow quake didn't wreak more havoc on Reno. A good way to imagine what happens to a building during an earthquake is to remember what happens to us when we are in a vehicle and we suddenly slam on the brakes um, and are thrown forward. That's deceleration. Or if we floor the accelerator and we push back into the seat, that's acceleration. And if it's high enough, we can get whiplash. In an earthquake, 
buildings can't accelerate that quickly either. The building is at rest, the earthquake occurs, the ground accelerates, the building lags behind, and these uh, whiplash forces in buildings can be very, very damaging. Instruments like the one buried in John Anderson's backyard have been recording the ground accelerations throughout the swarm. According to their readings, the magnitude 5 quake should have produced strong enough whiplash effects to cause widespread damage. Generally speaking, there was no structural damage in Mogul, but there should have been. Uh, the first question that you get asked as a scientist, then probably it's instrument error. We may not be using these instruments correctly. So a very quick way to, in fact, determine whether or not that's true is to, in fact, bring them into the laboratory and just be sure that we're getting the, the correct data. The University of Nevada, Reno's large-scale structures laboratory is home to four movable shake tables. These 14-square-foot platforms provide scientists with a way to simulate and study earthquakes in a controlled environment. This is one of our shake tables, and uh, it is driven by hydraulic actuators. The table moves on two rails, and um, because one rail can slide on the other, like this, the table can therefore move in any direction in this horizontal plane. Circles, ellipses, and of course, earthquakes. We can even amplify an earthquake. We can have larger earthquakes in the lab than are recorded in the field, which is often necessary to find out how things collapse. So in order to determine whether or not this instrument error, the accelerometers were brought into the lab, bolted down to one of the tables, and then subject to random uh, vibrations, but all the frequencies uh, that we see in an earthquake. The test proves that there isn't anything wrong with the instruments or the information they've collected. If the instruments don't have an error, then indeed the ground was moving during these earthquakes all throughout Mogul very high accelerations. And so the question then remains, why wasn't there more widespread damage? A closer examination of the data provides scientists with a possible explanation. They suspect the duration of the magnitude 5 earthquake saved the city from greater ruin. In the Mogul sequence, the largest earthquake only lasted three seconds. The duration of strong shaking, only about three seconds. We have a building here, uh, which is rather like a house in the sense that we have a basement and we have a first floor and a second floor and we have a roof. What, what we're going to do is we're going to recreate three seconds of the Mogul earthquake so um, we can turn it on and see what happens. And that kind of motion is what many people reported they saw in their houses in Mogul during the earthquake swarm, that the upper floors swayed particularly and then stopped and the building was still standing. In a three-second earthquake, the building's only just begun to respond, and the earthquake's gone. Now, truly damaging earthquakes, the ones that we saw in China last year, were like 30 seconds. Some even go to 50 and 60 seconds. A 20-second test illustrates the destructive effects longer-duration shakes can cause. And the, the result is obvious. We get total collapse of the building um, because of the fact that the ground shaking went on for a longer period of time and it was long enough for the building to, in fact, sway to the point of collapse. This gives us confidence in our postulation that, indeed, duration, the shortness of duration in the case of the Mogul sequence, was the reason for the lack of uh, widespread structural damage. But despite having dodged a bullet, the city of Reno is offered no respite in the wake of the magnitude 5. The quakes continue, and scientists are concerned that the swarm is only just entering a third, potentially catastrophic phase. We scaled up on April 15th, and then on the 24th, we scaled up again to another level of magnitude, and now on the 26th, we're at another new territory, a magnitude 5. The earthquakes weren't dying away. They weren't turning into an aftershock sequence. They were just continuing. I think the period between April 25th and and the end of April was the scariest of all for us. Residents brace themselves for the worst, and scientists barely have time to catch their breath before the swarm continues its onslaught. As Reno recovers from the magnitude 5 quake, no one can predict whether the swarm will continue to escalate. 
But having tracked the earthquakes for more than two months, scientists are able to detect an emerging pattern in its behavior. There's many, many earthquakes that were located, but we took the very highest quality locations and put them in a time sequence. In this animation, we can actually see how the thing progressed. And we can see in the early part of the sequence as it's confined to the Mogul and the southern Somerset area. There's the large, the main shock. And after the magnitude five, um, the, the sequence quickly extended to over eight kilometers long. As the pattern emerged, we have a nice, long, linear, uh, northwest striking structure. Faults are broken into categories depending on the angle and direction the Earth slips during a quake. In so-called dip-slip faults, one side of the Earth usually drops down or is thrust up over the other. And those give us the mountains and the valleys that we see across Nevada. But in strike-slip faults, one block of Earth slides past the other in a direction horizontal to the fault plane. The linear northwest pattern of the renal quakes leads scientists to believe it's a strike-slip fault that's causing the swarm. This tells them that the forces ultimately driving the quakes are probably tied to the plate boundary on the west coast. As the Pacific plate moves to the north, it's grabbing the large block that's the Sierra Nevadas, and it's wrenching it to the north as well. And Nevada is feeling the influences of that wrenching to the north. If you plot this fault and you plot the direction that the Sierras are moving, they're almost parallel. And, and so um, it's hard to imagine the Sierra moving and this not somehow being related to that. For weeks after the magnitude 5, the swarm continues to shake Reno with more earthquakes. Fortunately, none are as powerful. But one possibility causing concern is that the spreading swarm could set off a chain reaction of larger earthquakes on other faults nearby. This close-up view shows the heart of Reno, and the, the Mogul sequence is off in the western side of Reno. There's a uh, fault zone which is just to the southeast of, of this activity. And um, we can see that some of the activity is getting very close to this fault zone. But scientists debate whether or not these larger faults pose an immediate threat to Reno. The potential danger is having larger earthquakes. If we get up to six miles, eight miles of faults that could fail, that's a magnitude six size earthquake, which would involve all of Reno. The swarm has already escalated from magnitude two quakes to a magnitude five. Residents fear the swarm has something even worse yet in store. But then, just as mysteriously as the swarm arrived, the quakes begin to disappear. I know we were all very relieved to see it begin to slow down. Scientists believe the worst may be over, but with earthquakes, no one can say for certain. In June, there was a bit of a resurgence, like it was firing back up. And it wasn't until August, I think, that we began to get the sense that, okay, it's backing off, now we're having down to one a day or fewer, you know, May, June, July, that we're on the bubble. So we still watched it, but gradually all the other jobs we had to do began taking over and um, it just went into the background. As the level of earthquakes in Reno finally returns to normal, residents are left with a fallout of insecurity. Questions they had months ago about the nature of the swarm remain unanswered. Scientists again look to the known faults in the region to determine what caused it and why the quakes peaked at magnitude 5. We put them all on the map.